Please turn in your Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18 in your Bible. <clears throat> For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we pray tonight as we consider this truth that you are still speaking today. I pray, Father, that our hearts would be moved with the truth and how you want to use us, Father, to be vessels for thy great glory in giving forth the truth that the world may hear from God today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to just finish up from last week. Last week we were talking about the fact that God is still speaking today. And uh, this is from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. And uh, we're living in a time when there's a lot of people who are saying they hear audible voices. You can buy devotionals that are claiming, people are claiming that Jesus is giving them special messages today, and they're not talking about the Bible. So this is an important topic for us to be very, very clear. What does the Word of God say? In the Old Testament, prophets had visions, dreams. They heard God speak audibly to them. We saw that. And in this last day, God, of course, has sent forth his son, Jesus Christ, God who became flesh. And so the new covenant, the new promises, a better hope, all of that is through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And we thank the Lord for that. Jesus Christ hand-selected 11 men. Uh, He's hand-selected 12, but one of them was his betrayer, Judas, and he knew that. And then later on, he met the apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, and these 12, the 11, plus Saul of Tarsus, who became the apostle Paul, went forth, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit was rich in their lives, giving them a completion of all the words of Jesus Christ. We have the New Testament completed, Genesis to Revelation And Jesus Christ has spoken to us in these last days. Now, does that mean that God is not speaking today? No, nothing could be further from the truth. We saw that God is speaking today. He's speaking through his word. It's the Holy Spirit of God speaking through the written word of God is how God is speaking to his children today. And we concluded last week with Revelation 2 and 3. Remember, Jesus said to the angel of the church at Ephesus, right write to the angel of the church at Smyrna, write to the angel of the church at Philadelphia, write on every single one of the seven, Laodicea, all of them. And then each message closes with the same closing statement, doesn't it? He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so God the Holy Spirit is speaking today through the word of God, not in an audible voice, But through his word, God speaks to his children through the word of God. Now, it's not that God can't speak from heaven. Anyone who wants to say that we who hold this truth, that the revelation of God is completed, he's not giving special messages to special people today, he's not doing that. He's given us his word. And by the way, when you just take account of it, there's a lot of people who don't appreciate when I tell them this. But in the days of Isaiah... Even Isaiah, I mean, wonderful truth that God gave to Isaiah. All those chapters of truth that God gave, it was still only partial. Isaiah did not have available to him what you have available to you today in Genesis to Revelation. Do you realize that? You have a more complete revelation than Isaiah had, than Moses had. We have the word of God. God intended you to have his word so that you can turn and you can say with authority, if you're quoting from the scriptures, thus saith the Lord. 
We who hold that position are not saying God can't speak from heaven. I want to tell you God can do anything he wants to do. Amen. He's God. What we're saying is this is how God has chosen to speak today. God is speaking to us through the word of God by the spirit of God. All right, so we need to read the word of God. We can't neglect it. We need it. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear is how the book of Revelation opens up. Now, the question we want to tackle tonight is how is God speaking to the world? Is God speaking to the world? And the answer is he is, and the word of God reveals that to us. Notice here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, the message of the cross is what to those who are perishing? They're so glad. They're so glad you came to tell them that they were sinners and they need to repent and trust in Jesus Christ. No, they think that's foolishness. A, a, a savior who is crucified and risen again, praise the Lord. But a crucified savior? Paul said, we preach Christ crucified. Now, this is the power of God to those who believe. Paul said in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And you need to be convinced of that. When you share it, you need to have full faith that the person to whom you are speaking, if they embrace these words in faith, God will do a work of regeneration. God will do a work in their heart to save their soul. You've got to have faith in that. That's what God says in his word, and God does it. Did he do it in your heart? Amen. You're a living testimony that God saves souls when someone told you the gospel. To those who believe, it's the power of God. But to those who reject it, it's foolishness. Now, the point I want to get across here in verse 18 is there is a message that God has. There is a message for the unsaved. There is a message for the world. And how is the world going to hear? How is God speaking to the world? Well, what we'll see tonight as we put together scriptures, you know it, but I want you to see it in your Bible. When the child of God proclaims the gospel of salvation to the lost, it is God who is speaking to them. Now, this has tremendous words of comfort and encouragement. There are times when you have an opportunity to share the gospel, and in your flesh, your knees might start to knock. You might think, I don't know what to say. What if they ask me a hard question? I won't know the answer. That's our flesh, and we do. We are feeble. We don't always have all the answers. But that's the wrong way to approach. You can't be looking at yourself. What we need to do is trust the word of God. If you give them the word of God, God will speak to their heart. And so that's why I tell people when you share the gospel, be sure to include a verse of scripture. Be sure to share a verse that you might give opportunity for the spirit of God to speak to their hearts. Because God is speaking through his word to the unsaved too, but he's using believers to do it. That's God's chosen method. By the foolishness of preaching, God has purposed for the world to hear his voice. Do you understand that? You can be the voice of God if you will share the gospel with the unsaved. That's what we want to see tonight. Would you turn with me, first of all, to Mark chapter 16? Mark chapter 16. This is a glorious privilege, and we ought to be excited about the opportunity to tell others the good news. Fear not. As you are trusting in the Lord in faith, the Spirit of God will enable you. Uh, be diligent and prepare yourself. Memorize some verses of Scripture. Read. Find a good gospel tract and read it again a couple of times so that you are adept at sharing the message uh, with others. Take time to write out your own testimony of salvation. You are a living tract. Tell people how you came to know Jesus Christ is your Savior. And take the time to sit down and write out how God worked in your heart, what you learned, and write it out so that you can be adept at sharing your own message of salvation, how you came to know Jesus Christ. Here in Mark chapter 16, I want you to see verse 15. The Lord Jesus Christ appeared to the eleven on a number of occasions after he arose from the dead. And in verse 15, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to whom? Every creature. Every creature. God wanted 
everyone. God wants everyone to hear. Now, this commission is to the apostles, all right? We want to be clear on that. Jesus is then telling these 11 men, I want you to go, and I want you to tell everyone. And by the way, you read the book of Acts, and that's exactly what they did. And we even get a little more from church history. They went further than that, than just the known area around the Mediterranean. They went out further and told as many as they encountered the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, the Lord commissioned. There are some who would say that this doesn't affect the church today. And to answer that, I ask, turn to with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I think that that's just an argument in semantics and it's an unbalanced view of the word of God. I believe that what Jesus said to his apostles stands for all of us. It really does. But I don't have to try to prove that from Mark 16. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I want you to notice verse 18. Uh, I'll start in verse 17. You know that so well. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. So we're talking to believers now. A new creation through faith in Jesus Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Then you're saved and you've been brought into a right relationship with God. Wonderful, good news. And has given, what's the next word in your Bible? Do you have the word us in your Bible? Now, Paul's writing, he's one of the 12. Later on, Saul of Tarsus met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and we're going to see a little bit later on, Jesus commissioned him to go, but he wrote to just an ordinary local assembly. As a matter of fact, I'm so thankful that God the Holy Spirit wrote it in Corinthians, because it's not even the stellar church example, is it? When I think of stellar church examples, I think of Philadelphia. <laughs> That's a church that seemed to have it all together. I think of the Philippians. There's no perfect church. Paul had to write to the Philippians and said, true yoke fellow, come alongside and help these women. They're having a tough time. They're my co-workers in the ministry, but they're having a disagreement and there had to be some interpersonal reaction among believers. But Corinth, you probably wouldn't pick that as the best example of an assembly. And yet, in this letter to this assembly, Paul says, this ministry of reconciliation has been committed to us. God has given to us. I want to tell you that the apostles have moved on. They haven't made it to December 2024. <laughs> I don't know if I will either, we'll see. But I'm here in December 2023. That's in case anyone's tuned in who heard me made that mistake this morning. What a blunder. Good to keep us humble. The apostles have passed on. They're in glory. But who's here? Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing how God continues to bring his word such that people get saved and there continues to be a witness and a testimony for Jesus Christ? God has committed to us, just like he did to Corinth, just like he did to Philippi, just like he did to Thessalonica, just like he did to Smyrna, Pergamos. Name any of those local assemblies. He's committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. So verse 20, skip over verse 19 for now. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. It is our responsibility to be good statesmen for the Lord Jesus Christ and to do what? Tell them Christ died for your sins. The ministry of reconciliation has been committed to us. We need to tell everyone that God brings into our lives the gospel of salvation. Now, more specifically, let's go to Romans chapter 10, please. And I want to deal with a passage that speaks a little more directly about how is God speaking today to the world. We saw last week how he speaks to the church. The Holy Spirit speaks through the word of God to the church. But it's different with the world. God's method involves one more element and that's believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 13, you know 8, 9, and 10. 
that one believes with the heart and confesses their mouth, the Lord Jesus, that God has raised him from the dead. That's how God saves us. Verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now the question comes in verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? You will not call upon the Lord. Lord, save me. If you don't believe that you're lost and in your sins, if you don't believe that Jesus is God who came in the flesh and died on a cross and shed his blood to pay for you and for me. You can't believe that till you know it. You have to hear the gospel. And so the question then comes, how shall they believe in him whom they have not what? Heard. Do you see that? How can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How can they do that? Another question. Paul goes on with the next question. And how shall they hear without a what? A preacher. Now, everybody just says, shoo! That means it's pastor's responsibility. Be careful. The ministry of reconciliation has not been committed to the apostles alone. It's not been committed to pastors alone. It's not been committed to missionaries alone. Those are specially gifted people, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 and following. They are gifted men. Praise God for gifted men that go forth. But there are also Timothys, and there's the you's and the me's. I know that's not good English. But here we are, and the ministry of reconciliation has been committed to us. And the question is, how? How are they going to hear from God if there's no one who preaches it? The question goes on. One more question in verse 15. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Hmm. Unless they are sent. Three questions. The first one in verse 14. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? The pronoun here in this question refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that from the first question. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Verse 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The subject is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question, the first question in verse 14 is, how can they call on him if they haven't believed? And then our question, how shall they believe in him from whom they have not heard? Who is the him? It's Jesus. How can they believe in him if they haven't heard of him? They haven't heard from him. The answer comes in the next question. How shall they hear unless there's a preacher? God is going to send a preacher. And to be sure, there is the whole blessed call of God on gifted men, whether it's a preacher and teacher or it's a missionary. But the truth is God wants to send you into your family. God wants to send you into your place of employment. God wants to send you into your neighborhood to be someone who preaches. You say, I can't be a preacher. I never went to school. The word preach here just means to proclaim. That's all it means, to declare the truth. That's what a preacher is, somebody who declares the truth. As a matter of fact, it would be a lot more helpful today if we had fewer preachers who were so versed in all the works of men and just had a simple, a lot more simple people who knew what God says in his holy word and were willing to tell people, thus saith the Lord. That's how they'll hear, is when someone's willing to proclaim. And you don't have to be someone who has a theological degree. You just have to read the book. Read God's word. Let it permeate your heart. I shared this with someone recently. I'll never forget an illustration an old preacher gave me one time. Uh, he's not in glory yet. But he took a plate of water. He took a plate of water and he had a two by four, and he had a sponge. And he had, it was a group of preachers he had around the table, and he took the piece of two by four, and he plopped it down in the water, and he picked it up. And you know what happened, of course, the two by four was dripping water down in the plate. And he said, don't be this kind of a preacher, a two by four, somebody who gets wet in the word and drips with it. He took the sponge, and he put it down in the water, and then when he picked it up, he squeezed it out, and there was a gush of water that came out. He said, be this kind of a preacher. He said, be the kind of person that the word of God has permeated your heart and life, and let the spirit of God squeeze you so that the people can hear what God has to say. That got a hold of me. 
Let your life be permeated with the word of God. Don't be someone who just, well, I read that a couple weeks ago or something like that, or, or I read it just so I would have something to say. Be in the word of God so it immerses your whole life. And I want to tell you, when the opportunity comes, the spirit of God will just squeeze out of your mind and heart exactly what he wants to say to the lost. How shall they hear without a preacher? And yes, how shall they preach unless they are sent? Let's go back to 2 Corinthians now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I skipped over verse 19, so we have to go back and get it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The subject is, God has committed to us, verse 18, the ministry of reconciliation. That is the privilege of telling people God has made a provision whereby we can be right with God because we're not right with God. We're sinners separated from God by our sin. But God came. Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood to save us from our sins. Amen. What a blessed privilege it is to share that good news. Notice in verse 19, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. First of all, verse 18, the ministry, but second of all, the word. Now here's something wonderful. In verse 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. In other words, when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he did not come on his own. Jesus Christ detailed this all throughout his ministry. He said, I'm telling you what the Father said. I'm doing what the Father told me to do. And he said to his disciples, he said it also publicly, at least on one occasion, John records, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. How is that possible? I know it boggles our human understanding, but it's true. God was in Christ committing to the world the truth of salvation. Jesus said, he who hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. You're passed from death to life. Wonderful truth. God was in Christ reconciling the word to himself. By the way, if you're like one of these people that likes to get some of those little details, how was God in Christ? If that's just bothering you, pastors, take more time. Just remember that when Jesus was baptized at the River Jordan, who came down from heaven in the form of a dove and alighted upon our Lord Jesus Christ to empower Jesus for his ministry? Did Jesus need the Holy Spirit to do the ministry? Now be careful. Don't just answer that quick because it's almost like no matter what you say, we're going to be wrong. We're talking about the triune Godhead, but here's what I do know. I'm not going to answer that question. I'll tell you what I know. Jesus Christ is fully capable to do all the ministry that God gave to him as the second person of the triune Godhead. But I also know this. He didn't do it apart from the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit that God sent forth upon him. Why? Because he's God. And because you and I need the Holy Spirit. That's what we're going to see next. You and I are not capable in and of ourselves. Even though the Lord Jesus Christ was, he chose by means of the Spirit of God. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. That's not me saying that. That's God, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Wonderful truth. Why? You and I need the Spirit of God. Where are we without the Spirit? Nowhere. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. That's exactly where we would be without the Spirit of God unable to do anything to give God the glory. But God has sent forth his spirit into our hearts. Why? Look on. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading. What's the next word? Through. Yeah, you went two words. Good for you. Through us. Through. Now, I looked this up in the Greek. You can always tell by my tone what I'm going to say next. It says, through us. It's right there in the Greek. God is pleading through us. How is God speaking to the world? The Spirit of God is using a faithful child of God who's willing to present themselves. I'm a vessel, Lord, and I want you to use me to speak the word of reconciliation. God will use you speak his word, he will speak to the world when you tell them the gospel. Isn't this wonderful? 
God is pleading through us. And so Paul went on. It's almost as if he couldn't hold back. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness, we might become the righteousness of God in him. Wonderful good news of gospel salvation. How is God speaking to the world today? Can God speak from heaven? Sure he can. But God has chosen to speak through his children. By the spirit of God who's come to live within our hearts using the word of God, particularly the gospel message that he's given to us. God is speaking to the world through his children. He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation. And so I echo the question that Paul asked in Romans chapter 10. How shall they hear without a preacher? Oh, that we might speak forth the gospel news to those that we come in contact with. Why? That God would speak to hearts. Are you concerned? I won't know what to say. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Lord, I don't know what to say, but help me in this moment. I want this person to hear from you today. Wonderful privilege and opportunity. Now, does God send preachers? Amen, he does. Would you turn with me to Acts 26? Acts 26. As we go to Acts 26, I'm just going to share with you, please understand, um, the tank is getting a little bit empty, so we're just going to look at a few more verses. I'm going to get done just a little bit early, so praise the Lord that we can look in his word tonight. Acts chapter 26, please notice the Apostle Paul sharing his own personal testimony, and as he shared here, there's more information given to us of the conversation that he had with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Verse 14, we hear the Lord Jesus calling out to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And uh, then after Saul responded in verse 15, who are you, Lord? He responded, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. Jesus was going to tell him more truth. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles. Do you ready? To whom I now send you. How shall they preach unless they are sent? God called this man and saved this man. And then he sent this man. And to be sure, there are those that God calls to be missionaries and pastors But as we saw in 2 Corinthians 5, the ministry of reconciliation has been committed to us. What does that mean? We need to support missionaries because it's our responsibility, the ministry of reconciliation. And we need to be available to God to speak his word, the gospel, to those that we come in contact with in our lives, in our families, and in our neighborhoods. Notice now, God says to Paul, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified. How? By faith in me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved like you can never imagine you'll be saved. God will commit to you his riches. Amen? Wonderful truth. And so, Titus chapter 1 Titus chapter 1, as Paul writes a very short pastoral letter to Titus, he wrote two of them to Timothy, and he wrote one to Titus, turn to Titus chapter 1, Paul reminds Titus, we want to see verse 3, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 in chapter 1, Paul opens up this letter, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began, but 
in due time, right now, manifested his word, how? Through preaching. The preaching of the cross. It may be foolishness to those who reject it, but it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. And so, the manifestation of God's word, that means the light, the making known of God's word is through proclaiming it. We need to speak the word of God because God is speaking to the world today through his children that they would speak his word to the lost. And so, 2 Timothy, just go back a page or two to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul, when he writes his second letter to Timothy, says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to what? Special people. We think that you've got to be special to be able to tell people the gospel. No, you just need to be faithful. Faithful men. Faith, Timothy, I want you to look for faithful men, and I want you to tell them what I told you. And what are they going to do? Be faithful, and they will commit these to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is God's plan, to transfer his truth from one generation of Christians to another. Why? Because God wants to speak through us to the world. That's what he wants to do. He wants to speak through us. This is God's plan. This is God's purpose. And so if you look at chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul says to Timothy, Paul knows he's leaving the scene. God is calling me home. Paul got close so many times, <laughs> stoned and left for dead, a day and night in the deep, in prison, and he wrote to Philippi, I don't know if I'll be delivered or if I'm going to face the lions again. I don't know. But now he knew, I have finished my course. I have run the race, and now there's laid up for me a crown. Paul knew he was leaving the scene. And so what did he want to encourage Timothy to do? Verse 1, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. May God just tug our hearts to realize that when you share the gospel with the unsaved, God is speaking. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this glorious truth from your word. It's your purpose that the world should hear from you, and your desire, the burden of your heart, is to speak through your children. You've committed to us the word of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation. So bless us, Father, that we might in faith look to you to be faithful witnesses who will live the life and love of Jesus Christ as you enable us and tell others the good news. Thank you, Father, that you are speaking to your children today, and thank you that you are speaking through your children to a lost and a dying world. Help us, Father. We'll give thanks to you in Jesus' name. Amen.